All right, hey, what's up, y'all? Hope you had a good Christmas break. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick little video to welcome you back and uh, tell you about this assignment that I got for you this week. Uh, this assignment will be due on Friday, which is January 7th, I think. So, it's Nope, the 8th, January 8th. See, even I'm having a hard time coming back from break. So this will be due Friday, January 8th. Uh, you can do it anytime on your own, as long as it's due by then, as long as it's turned in by then. Um, and so what it is, all it is really, it's just a quick review from the first semester. And um, I made some questions that are hopefully really easy. I don't really want you to get too bogged down on this. And I don't want you to spend too much time on this because um, I want you to still kind of continue to enjoy some uh, break time away from school. Um, so it's, I believe, like six questions. Um, and each question has a few little components. And what I really honestly wanted to do was just go through it with you and um, not necessarily give you direct answers, but really just kind of help you out and point you in the right direction so that that way um, kind of jogs your memory without you being like, oh man, I don't remember any of this. Because I know that does happen, all right? <laughs> I couldn't even figure out what the date is for Friday. So, you know, I get it, I get it. This stuff, uh, long Christmas break. So there we go. Um, so let's just go through this, here we go. Uh, so like I said, first semester review, first question, what's your name and class period? Um, if you don't know your class period, that's fine. Just tell me your first and last name and I can figure it out, all right? <laughs> Even those of you at home that I've never met, I know which class period you're in by now. All right, so your first real question. It says, in the latter half of the 1800s, the Transcontinental Railroad and the Homestead Act opened up the West for settlement. So let's pause right there. Remember, Transcontinental Railroad, it allows people to travel to the West very quickly, and the Homestead Act um, it's basically free land for settlers who wanted to move to the West to begin farming. Um, now, there was a problem though. There were, not, there were already Native Americans living in that region and the government did kind of some really bad stuff to those Native Americans. So first question, how did the Dawes Act affect Native Americans? And I say, please describe the assimilation. So what I'm looking for here, here is for you to describe uh, just kind of how the Dawes Act really focused on changing Native American culture. Remember, it sent them to boarding schools where they'd have to cut their hair, change their name, uh, wear different clothing, adopt Christianity, speak English, that sort of thing. So it really ends Native American culture or it attempts to end Native American culture. And that's really, really bad. It's not a good thing, not something to be proud of in history, okay? And then secondly, where were Native Americans forced to move? So the American government kicks uh, Native Americans off their original tribal lands and uh, moves them onto life on reservations. Now life on a reservation, not a whole lot of resources, not gonna be any kind of jobs or anything like that. Native Americans are also not really used to settling down and farming and owning individual land territories. They're more used to moving in groups. Um, a lot of these Native Americans in the West were nomadic. Um, so they're used to moving around. They're not used to sort of a Western or an American uh, way of life uh, that Americans in the East were living. So life on a reservation is really bad. Um, like I said, not a lot of resources. A lot of these things are out in the middle of the desert. Um, and even nowadays, poverty is still a huge problem on reservations, okay? So hopefully that wraps that one up for you. Um, if you really need some major help, obviously you can Google any of this stuff. Or you can go back and watch some of my old videos. I've gone over all this stuff in all the other videos that I've posted. Um, so if you need some help, let me know, okay? All right, moving on, number three. So we're gonna switch directions here. We're gonna move to the South. So that was about the American West. Now we're moving to the American South, okay? And it says, in the South in the late 1800s, African-Americans faced extreme discrimination. So your first little question is, uh, what were the Jim Crow laws, i.e. separate but equal? Now, this Jim Crow era actually starts, doesn't really start until 1896 with the Plessy versus Ferguson, which was about um, the ruling of the train cars, where you had to have a separate train car for African Americans and a separate train car for white Americans. And um, so the idea of separate but equal was that African Americans would have all separate facilities, separate schools, separate restrooms, separate train stations, separate everything. And the idea is that it would be equal, but in reality, it was never equal. And in fact, the facilities for African Americans were always inferior. And that's a definitely a true form of racism. It's uh, not providing the same standard just because of someone's race. Okay, so that's what the Jim Crow laws is. It's this idea of having separate places, separate facilities, separate everything for whites and blacks, but the ones for African Americans were not the same. Okay, all right. Number two, why was African, or the second one, why was African American disenfranchisement an important goal for racist Southern whites? Disenfranchisement, that's a key word there. 
Enfranchisement means the right to vote. So disenfranchisement means taking away the right to vote. So um, why was this an important goal for racist Southern whites? Well, the idea in America is that when you vote, when you have that political power, you are going to hopefully make a change. You'll, you'll, your voice will be heard, right? That's a democracy. Um, so for racist Southern whites, they do not want African Americans to have a voice because that will mean eventual change. That will mean improvement of the lives of African Americans. And these racist Southern whites, they want to keep African Americans on the low end of the social life, the economic life, every aspect of life in America, okay? So essentially, uh, white, racist Southern whites did not want African Americans to vote because they did not want them to, want them to move up in life, okay? All right, last one. What types of violent acts did racists and KKK members take against African Americans who spoke out or voted against racism? Um, it's usually a form of intimidation. So they would go to the African American's house, they might throw rocks at it, break windows, they might bust in and beat you up. And at the very last, the worst part of it, of course, goes to lynching. And lynching, what it means, it's murder by a mob of people. And unfortunately, this happened pretty frequently in the South during that era. Um, all the way up through the 1950s and 60s. Um, and lynching, essentially, the way they did it usually was by hanging, uh, hanging you know, from your neck in a tree. It's really, really just a terrible time in history um, and not something, not something really to be proud of or really look back on with any kind of respect. It's terrible, okay? So um, that covers that one. Unfortunately, we did have to go over that. Um, if you got any questions about that, again, Google it, email me, or watch some of my old videos. Let's move on to the Gilded Age. So it says, around the turn of the 20th century, American cities grew because of the growth of industry, so more factories in big cities. This is called the Gilded Age. Remember, gilded means covered in gold, but on the inside, it's not actually gold, because America looked great from the outside, but when people came here and saw, things actually weren't so great, all right, because there's a lot of poverty, working conditions are really bad, and the greed of corporate leaders and politicians was just outstanding at the time, and outstanding in a bad way. So, first question, who are some of the leading business people slash inventors of the era? So, we got a lot here. Um, first one that's very important is Henry Bessemer. Without him, I don't really think any of this would have happened. He invented the Bessemer process, which converts iron to steel. Steel is very lightweight. It's very uh, good for building. You can build skyscrapers with it. The railroads expand. Basically, everything expands during this era because of Henry Bessemer. Um, then you get guys like Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, U.S. Steel. Uh, makes a big fortune off U.S. Steel. Then you get Rockefeller, who's oil. Um, and so you got J.P. Morgan, who's big into banking. Um, on the other side, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you get um, inventors in electricity like Tesla and Alexander Graham Bell and Edison, those guys. Um, and you also get a very interesting businesswoman, um, Madam C.J. Walker, who was uh, very, very important in that she created African-American beauty products and beauty products for women. Um, and she was uh, one of America's first uh, self-made millionaires as far as being a woman and being an African-American. So it's very, very cool, very, very interesting. Something to be proud of there, okay? All right, second thing, why did people move from the American countryside and poor European countries to big American cities? Well, not a lot of jobs in the countryside. It's hard to be a farmer. It's poverty, it's, it's, a, it's a cycle. It's relying on the weather and it's very, very difficult, okay? Same thing with poor European countries. Got a lot of push and pull factors, and the push factors would be things like um, uh, war, famine, disease, maybe the government's taking advantage of the people, not treating people right. Um, anything that's gonna make you want to move out, that's a push factor, and there are a lot of those. So poverty is really the big one for these. And pull factors, that brings people into the city, so that's jobs mainly. Jobs, more freedom, more opportunity, maybe you can buy land here, whatever, okay? So essentially jobs, more freedom, opportunities to make money. All right, the next one, what was life like for the working class, i.e. poor people in American factories and cities? Life is very bad, okay? Uh, they're having to work six, seven days a week, uh, long hours. Uh, we're talking like 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Um, they're not in any good safety, safety conditions, um, no precautions, no rules, no standards. Um, the places where they have to live, they can't really afford anything because these big companies don't pay very well. So they have to live in very overcrowded tenement houses. Do you remember tenement, tenement houses? Uh, we looked at a picture and it was like eight people living in one room and it's really disgusting and gross. Uh, so life for the working class, very, very hard, all right? 
And last question, how did corrupt politicians like Boss Tweed take advantage of the people during this era? Well, remember, he would come up with these construction plans and these projects, and he'd get together with people and he'd say, hey, but it's, uh, we're gonna build a courthouse and we're gonna say it costs a million dollars, but actually it's only gonna cost about 500,000. We're gonna pocket that money. And that's called a political machine. And basically what it is, is it's taking advantage of the taxpayers, it's lying to the people. Remember, they would employ these poor immigrants and they'd say, hey, I gave you a job, so you better vote for me, right? Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a way of greed, stealing from taxpayers, lying, taking advantage of the system, okay? And in a way, yes, you could argue Boss Tweed, yeah, he took care of poor people, he took care of immigrants, but it's not the right way to go about it. All right, so that's the Gilded Age. Cool, moving on. See, we're almost done. We got, what, a couple more. All right. Uh, so because of the problems of the Gilded Age, people started to fight for a better life in America. And it says the era in the early 1900s became known as the progressive era. Progressive means progress, forward thinking, things are gonna get better in America for Americans and particularly, hopefully for poor people. That was the goal, okay? So you get two groups of people that emerged during this time period. Social Darwinists and uh, followers of the social gospel. So let's talk about those. The social Darwinists, those are people who are rich people who believe they are rich because they are something special. They look down on poor people. They say, poor people, you're poor because there's something wrong with you. You have not worked as hard as I have. You have not done the things I have done. You are never going to move up in life unless you take care of yourself. Now we know that, that that's not actually true because if someone is born into a rich family and they don't really have to work all that hard and they're already living in a better place, they can go to better schools, they have a better life overall, that's gonna put them at a better position starting off than someone who was born in Southern Italy and has to get on a boat and ride over here and live in a poor New York City uh, neighborhood and work very, very hard and experience lots of hardship, okay? So the social Darwinists, they look down on poor people and they say, hey, you need to work harder. Now, unfortunately, that's going to be a major portion of the government leaders at the time. It's going to be a major portion of those corporations, those big business leaders. Um, the rich people really fall into this social Darwinist category. Opposite side, we get the social gospel. Social gospel people, they believe in wanting to help out poor people. They want to provide medical care for poor people. They want to teach immigrants how to speak, speak English. They want to give them money to maybe buy a set of clothes to go to a job interview. They want to give them food. They want to give them a place to sleep, things like that. So social Darwinists, no help for poor people. Social gospel, do want to help poor people. And two members of these, of this social gospel, Jane Addams is one. She remember she opened the settlement house in Chicago called the Hull House. And that's a place where immigrants could go. And like I said, they could get medical care. They could learn to speak English. They could get a meal. They could get a fresh set of clothes. Anything like that just to kind of help the basic necessities. Jacob Reese, he's a little different. He's not necessarily a social gospel follower, but he is someone who does change the lives of poor immigrants. Because what he did, if you recall, is he took pictures of poor people living in tenement houses and the, the terrible places in New York City and other cities, um, just documenting the hardships of the lives of these poor immigrants. And people saw this and they're like, whoa, we gotta do something better. We gotta help out these people. I can't believe I'm living in the same country where this is going on. Let's help these people out. So he kind of exposed the problems of the poor people, okay? All right, next question, what do labor unions fight for? Labor unions, just an organization of workers who get together. They might go on strike. Um, they might just uh, not work. They show up and have a sit-in or a walk-out or something like that where they just say, hey, we're not gonna work until things get better. And what they're fighting for, mainly more pay and better conditions, okay? So more pay and better conditions are really what labor unions fought for. All right, next one, what was the purpose of trust busting and anti-monopolistic laws slash regulations such as the Sherman and Clayton antitrust laws? Uh, if you recall, these corporations were getting way too much power and it was really hurting the economy because small businesses could not compete. And when these big, big corporations start to take over and they own all aspects of the industry, your product, the quality of the product, and just the general aspect of business just really starts to decline. And so the government steps in, specifically like Teddy Roosevelt, and they say, hey, we need to regulate the power of these monopolies. We need to break up these trusts. And it's going to help out you and me, the consumer, and it's going to help uh, increase competition between small businesses, okay? So the purpose of trust busting and anti-monopolistic laws and regulations helps us as consumers. Um, things are cheaper. Things are better quality. 
competition among business is again increased and that's very good because you want uh, companies competing for your business because then they're going to have to make better products and they're going to have to have fair prices okay all right the next one kind of changes gears here how were women's rights increased during the progressive era remember women gained the right to vote in 1920. Uh, in the early 1900s, women start to leave home and go into the workplace working in factories, usually textile factories. And uh, because of this, they start to move up economically and they start talking and they start figuring out, hey, we can do better in life. We should have the right to vote. We live in this democratic country. We should have a voice as well, okay? And switching gears again, uh, we go to Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois or Du Bois. Uh, both of them are African-American men. African American leaders in the civil rights movement, very early civil rights movement. And Washington says, you know what, African Americans, let's work hard, let's save money, and eventually we will gain uh, the respect of racist whites and we will move up in life to be equal. Du Bois, he's got, or Dubois, he's got a little bit of a different argument. He says, hey, we need to fight for political rights now, we need to fight to end racism now, and the way to do it is by uh, sending African Americans to college and electing them, electing them into pol political leadership. Ooh, can't talk, okay? So both fighting for rights for African Americans just have different ways of doing it, okay? All right, we're moving right along. Sweet, we're almost done. Cool, all right, now, number six. As America became a wealthy nation, the government decided to flex its power on the global stage, and we entered the age of imperialism. Ba -ba -ba. So it says, what are the two main desires of the American government for taking over slash expanding territory around the world? Okay, and it says, hint, making money is the basis, but how? All right, it's a very simple, very, very easy answer here, okay? So what you're gonna wanna focus on here is uh, raw materials, that's stuff that you can turn in, natural resources, wood, rubber, oil, iron, anything that you can turn into something and sell it. Raw materials and new markets. So that's going to actually really gonna be your answer. Raw materials and new markets, okay? New markets means uh, different countries around the world that wanna buy our stuff that we make, okay? Uh, and then it says the government hid the motive of making money by saying America was spreading democratic ideals. What does that mean? And this goes all the way back to what you learned in eighth grade about manifest destiny. Remember, manifest destiny was the idea that Americans were superior because we were a democracy and because we were Christian. So uh, the government goes back to this idea and says, hey, you know what? We're kind of doing manifest destiny again, but on a global scale. We want to take over a lot more places. Um, so they're saying, you know what, well, the reason why it doesn't really have to do with making money, we're, that, we're not about that. What we're saying is we are spreading our wonderful beliefs, our wonderful attitudes, our wonderful outlook on the world to the rest of the world because America is the best, right? Okay, that's what the goal, the kind of the, uh, the, the thing that hid this agenda of making money. Making money is what imperialism is all about. It was getting to those uh, raw materials and those new markets. But you can't just go out and be like, hey, we want to make some money. We're going to take this stuff from you and we're going to take over your place. You have to say, no, 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 no. We're coming here to show you the light of democracy and Christianity, etc. Okay? And again, that's very hypocritical because uh, if you're a democracy, the people rule, right? But if you're taking over other places, are those people being allowed to rule? Don't think so. Okay? So it's an interesting time period here. All right, let's keep moving. What are some examples of territories slash countries that America took over or received from the Spanish-American War? So basically during this time period, what are some new places that America really gets involved in? Obviously the first one's gonna be Cuba, okay? Remember they had sugar there. Hawaii, also as a result of the Spanish-American War. The Philippines as a stepping stone to being able to trade with China, okay? Um, Puerto Rico is another. And you could also argue that a lot of countries in South America, due to the expansion of the Panama Canal, uh, when the Panama Canal was created, America really has to show off and flex some force down there in Panama and Central America, okay? Also during this time, uh, we get the Roosevelt Corollary, which essentially says European countries, we are dominant in the Western Hemisphere, don't even come over here anymore. We are going to show power to South America, Central America, don't bother us, all right? So next one, as a result of global imperialism, meaning a lot of countries, specifically in Europe, uh, trying to be in empires, uh, World War I began. And so why did America eventually have to join the fight? Remember, America doesn't initially join. Uh, the war broke out in 1914, and it's happening over there, and America's kind of watching, like, eh, we don't need any part of this. We're too busy making money right now. 
Um, but eventually America does get dragged into the war, and there are two reasons. Uh, first off is going to be the submarine warfare, German U-boats, uh, this unrestricted submarine warfare. Remember, Germany was going crazy, uh, blowing up any and all ships that it believed were kind of a threat or within, were sailing within the war zone. And, you know, we talked about the Lusitania and the United States smuggling weapons and supplies to the Allies. So you can't fully blame Germany here, but that's a big reason. So German U-boat warfare. Um, and then the other reason could be the Zimmerman telegram. And this actually is kind of a direct threat to the United States. Uh, it was, remember, Germany sent that letter to Mexico saying, hey, uh, when America joins the war, we need you to be our friend. And uh, remember, it was intercepted, America found out, and they're like, really? Geez, now we gotta go fight. And in 1917, we joined the war. The war is over in 1918, so America definitely victorious here. Um, and Wilson's got a big plan for after the war to kind of create a new world government, create one big alliance of all the countries of the world. He called it the League of Nations. Now, at this point, it's not super popular because the war, the people, everybody's kind of getting over this trauma of the war because remember, this war is very brutal. Uh, first modern war as far as machine guns, tanks, poison gas, a lot of bad stuff, major, major casualties. We're talking hundreds of millions of people, okay? Really bad, all right? And so Americans, as just as a populace, they look at this and they say, hey, we don't really want any part of being friends with all these European countries. We wanna stay over here, we wanna make money, we wanna live a good life, we don't wanna worry about this, we don't wanna get dragged into all these problems. So that's really the main reason why, but there's a few like specific reasons, so let's go through them. So why did Americans oppose joining the League of Nations? First of all, it's probably gonna get us into another fight. All right, these entangling foreign alliances, remember that phrase? Uh, Americans don't wanna get wrapped up in other countries' business. They say, hey, where did it get us before? Nowhere good, all right? Secondly, you've got a huge block of voters who just entered the scene, women voters. And if you recall, women voters, they don't want their husbands, fathers, sons, brothers, they don't want their male counterparts going to fight in a foreign war. It's very unpopular, okay? So women voters are anti-League of Nations because of that. And thirdly, the German Americans living here, remember, at this time, America was a very, very young nation, and a lot of people remembered their immigrant roots, and America was made up of a lot of German people. Uh, and they looked at this League of Nations, and the Treaty of Versailles, and the League of Nations go hand in hand. The Treaty of Versailles was terrible for Germany. And German Americans look at this and they say, you know, we can't support this whole big thing because it's too harsh on Germany, okay? So uh, the reasons, America becomes isolationist, meaning we're just minding our own business. Women voters don't wanna be a part of it because their sons, brothers, etc., are going to war. And thirdly, German Americans don't support the Treaty of Versailles, okay? All right, last one. After World War I, America enters a prosperous era known as the Roaring Twenties. So first question, how did people spend their money during the 1920s. Well, now they've got money and they're happy because we've gotten through this tough time known as the Great War, World War I, and they say, hey, let's spend some money on leisure and entertainment. And what I'm talking about here is listening to the radio. Remember, radio ownership skyrocketed, and as a result, we get a pop culture in America, which is really cool. Um, so leisure and entertainment, listening to the radio, going to the movies, learning about pop culture, getting into celebrities, buying stuff, because of the war, we have all these new inventions. Um, America is just on the fast track to success, and, and especially industrial success. So you get things like refrigerators, toaster ovens, even band-aids, like just all this new stuff in the 20s, and people get excited. And the problem is they get a little too excited, and they start to buy on credit. There's so nothing wrong with buying on credit. Remember, buying on credit means you take home whatever it is today, so say the iPhone sitting there, Take home your iPhone today and you're gonna pay it off over the course of two years. And people get too excited and they say, hey, I'm gonna buy a car, I'm gonna buy a radio, I'm gonna go to the movies 18 times, I'm gonna buy a refrigerator, I'm gonna do whatever I want because it's the 20s and life is good, okay? This is also called buying on installment plans. The problem with that is people get in over their heads, it's too much debt, and then they can't pay it back. And then that leads to bankruptcy and other things, but we'll get there. Next thing, how did the automobile change America's economy and Amer America's social life? The economy booms as a result because think about all the things that go along with cars, okay? So first of all, you've got the car factories themselves, automobile factories, Henry Ford and the assembly line and whatnot, massive amount of jobs. Then you get mechanic shops, you get tire shops, you get um, need people to build roads. You need all these things that go into cars that make a lot of money. So America's economy starts booming during the 20s, which is really good. 
Also, America's social life changes because now people are mobile. They can leave the countryside and go to the city and hang out. They can travel to Florida. We got America just growing culturally all over just because people are moving and exchanging ideas a whole lot easier, okay? And remember, for the youth, it means a whole big thing, too, because now they can go and uh, pick up their girlfriend or boyfriend and go out riding around, and instead of hanging out with mom and daddy, they can go learn about lives themselves, okay? And we're not going to go there. <laughs> All right, then we're the next one. What were the Great Migration and the Harlem Renaissance? So the Great Migration, remember, life was still pretty bad for African Americans in the South during this era. And they decided, hey, you know what? There's jobs in the cities of the North. Let's get out of the South. And it's a huge migration of African Americans from the South to the cities in the North, okay? And that creates a cultural change. And one of the big, long-lasting cultural changes is something called the Harlem Renaissance. And all that means, it's a time period of great art, music, literature, poetry, uh, created by African Americans, and it was a celebration of African American culture, which is really, really good. It's a great time period. It's a time we get like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Zora Neale Hurston, um, Langston Hughes. So really great artists and musicians and writers come about there because of this time period, okay? Now, even though it's a great time period, even though it's a roaring 20s, wonderful time, prosperous, etc., there's still kind of some problems, okay? You can never escape problems. Um, so the next thing it says, explain the conflict between traditionalists and modernists during the era. So the 20s is a time period of change. Things are moving forward and very quickly. A lot of people tend to resist change. They don't like change. And the people back then who resisted that change, they're called traditionalists. So these are people who are more fundamentalist, old school, more based on religion, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there are people who kind of like, for example, the Scopes trial, we have this huge debate between the traditional view of religion, the creation story, versus science, the evolutionary theory, um, and it's just this huge conflict. Also, traditionalists sometimes, and like I said, it's not bad to, to be traditionalists, there are bad aspects of it though, such as racists. Remember, the KKK grows huge during this time, okay? Because it's people seeing things like the Harlem Renaissance and they push back against it, they didn't like it, these racist Southern whites. And so the KKK grows, and that would be an example of traditionalists. So traditionalists is kind of like this old school, resistant to change mentality in America. Excuse me real quick. <coughs> Haven't talked this much in a while, all right? Next thing is modernists. So we talked about traditionalists, old school, religious-based, fundamental style. Modernists are gonna be your forward-thinking people. And a big group of people who symbolize the modernists of the era are the flappers. And if you recall flappers, they are women during the 1920s who challenged social norms, they wore short skirts, smoked cigarettes, drank alcohol, danced, had fun, just enjoyed life in general. Um, and uh, so these, gonna, these people are gonna be kind of the idea of let's move forward, let's let go of this old way of life that's holding us back. Let's think more about science, let's do, let's, you know, let's get into what possibilities could be out there. And so it's gonna be a big clash, and we really see that uh, embodied by the Scopes trial in 1925 in Tennessee, okay? And you can talk about that if you want to. All right, let's move on. Next one, what was the effect of prohibition on America? Prohibition, remember, it was when the government tried to uh, outlaw alcohol, and it's just a gigantic failure um, because people really liked to drink alcohol in America. Remember, life was pretty hard, and at the end of the day, a lot of these people just wanted to have a drink. And America uh, said, you know what, we're gonna try this. We're gonna try this experiment of not having alcohol to see if our society changes, because society had a lot of problems, a lot of poverty, violence, racism, a lot of problems in society. And they thought prohibition alcohol would, if you get rid of alcohol, maybe the problems will go away. Unfortunately, that didn't happen at all. In fact, the problems tended to get worse. Because people really now just drank out of rebellion. They did it because it was something fun to do, and it was kind of a way of just being rebellious against the government. People really didn't care. There wasn't a great way to enforce this. But unfortunately, big uh, criminals see an opportunity here. They say, hey, you know what? We can import alcohol from Canada. We can import alcohol from the Bahamas. We can get it from all over the world and we can sneak it into America. Also, we can make it here at home. We can make moonshine and then we can sell it. So big criminals take an opportunity here and we get the rise of organized crime like the mob and the mafia who make tons and tons of money. You get Al Capone, this dude's making the equivalent of like $2 billion a year in modern money, okay? He's like hundreds of millions of dollars just a celebrity criminal, and it's because, it's really only because of prohibition, okay? So prohibition, major failure, um, and the rise of organized crime. Organized crime just skyrockets during this time period, okay? All right, and last question, then I'm gonna leave y'all alone. What was the effect of runaway credit and an inflated stock market in 1929? Remember, runaway credit goes back to this one. Um, it's when people just got into way too much debt. And uh, so these companies, 
people are buying a lot, but they're buying it with money they don't have. So these companies seem really, really good and they seem like they're doing really well, but eventually people don't, they can't buy anymore. The, the credit runs out. The bank says, hey, you've got too much debt. Sorry, we can't do it. And these investors in the stock market who had been buying all these stocks all along, they kind of have a panic moment when they see people stop buying. And what happened in 1929 was all these stock market investors, they have a massive sell-off. They say, hey, these companies really aren't actually doing as good as we thought they were. And don't worry, we're gonna go over this next week. These companies are really not doing as great as they thought that, we, that they were. And uh, we need to sell this stock quickly before everyone else realizes. And so one seller starts selling, another starts selling, and you get people just a massive sell-off. And when that happens, the value of the stocks just drops drastically. And it drops so fast, in fact, that the stock market crashed, okay? So the effect of runaway credit and inflated stock market was that it crashed. And then from there, you got people running to the bank, and I'm getting ahead of myself in the next week, but I wanna go ahead and give you a heads up. Uh, people run to the banks, they withdraw all their money, the banks run out of money, the banks close, and we enter, and here's really your answer, we entered the Great Depression. And that's our uh, very first topic for next week, which I'm actually really excited about. It's a very interesting time period in history. It's sad, it's depressing, you could even say. <laughs> um, but, uh, so yeah, so we'll get into the depression next week. That was a terrible dad joke, but it's funny anyway. So there you go. Um, email me if you got any questions. You can go back and watch some of the old videos. You can Google this stuff. It really doesn't matter to me. Uh, whatever you need to do to get it done. Guys, hope you had a wonderful holiday break. Hopefully you had a great break and uh, hopefully you're ready to get back into learning and doing some new stuff, because I am, I'm excited. We got a depression, we got World War II, we got the 50s, we got Vietnam. We'll get to the 80s and really that's probably gonna take us right up to the end of the school year. So guys, hope you're doing well. Help, uh, hit me up if you need any help on any of this and uh, have a great day. Bye.